Um, so uh, I'm going to briefly introduce Daniela, Thomas, and um, Emma. Uh, and I, again, want to thank them all for being here tonight. So, so uh, honored that you're sharing your work and your ideas with us, and honored that you're all here tonight to discuss this very important subject. Um, Daniela uh, Naomi Molnar is an artist, poet, and writer working with mediums of language, image, paint, pigment, and place. Uh, Dr. Thomas Doherty is a client, clinical and environmental psychologist based in Portland, Oregon, who has developed a specialty addressing people's concerns about environmental issues and climate change. And Emma Maris writes about the environment and other topics for National Geographic, Wired, The New York Times, and The Atlantic, among other publications. Um, now I'm going to hand things off to Daniela, um, and she will take it from there. Thank you, Daniela. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here on one of the few non freezing cold rainy days that we've had in Portland. Um, taking time to sit in front of your screen and and think about this um, issue. It's really a privilege to be with you all. Thank you. So the the plan for tonight um, is that uh, Thomas will talk and then Emma will talk and then I will talk. Um, after each talk, there will be time for um, a little bit of, of questions and, and answers. Um, but the primary goal for tonight is for us to gather information. Um, and in the next, um, next time we meet, if you're able to make it on Saturday morning, we will um, have far more time to um, share ideas. So for tonight, um, the, the, the interaction will be fairly minimal. And on Saturday, you can expect a lot of um, exchanging of ideas. So just to kind of set that stage. Um, at the end of everyone's presentations, mine and Thomas's and Emma's, um, I will offer a creative prompt um, that you will all be able to take home with you or keep home with you <laughs> and um, think about over the next few days um, and then bring back your reactions to it on Saturday. So unless there are any pressing questions at the moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Thomas. And Thomas um, is such an inspiration. I mean, Rosel offered some, some great basics about um, the work that you do, Thomas, but Really, it's, it's such an honor to have you here with us. So thank you for being here and I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Daniela. Can you hear me okay? Is everything good yes. and good? Well, it's really an honor to be here and um, I'm going to share, I'm gonna speak for about 20 minutes or so and I'm gonna share some slides while I speak. So I'm gonna see if I can share my screen and see if that will work. Um, <clears throat> so you should be seeing my circles expanding title slide. Um, yes, the gift of climate grief. My, my hope is that I could um, kind of get us started in this process tonight and make some comments that are going to be helpful for, for Emma and Daniela and for you all. And then that will lead into Saturday. Um, just kind of navigating this whole terrain of, of, of climate grief. Um, so um, I invite you all just to take a breath and just be here. You've had busy days and, and you're doing a lot of stuff. So if you can just kind of Give yourself a moment to take a few breaths and settle in wherever you are, you know, coming from, find your seat and just, uh, you know, it's really lucky to have this time to, to talk like this. It's pretty rare to have these kind of discussions. So it's really something to be thankful for. So take some breaths. This is a serious topic. Um, some of you is very close to your heart, uh, close to you, close to your most important thoughts about life. So I want to just honor that, you know. We'll talk about a lot of things and I can be either upbeat or downbeat or use humor or not, but it's a serious real topic for people, this idea of climate grief. And so I thought I would just start out with some ground rules that help me to orient to this discussion. And it's things that I've learned, you know, through trial and error over the years. And I think it'll be helpful for all of us uh, for any discussion about environmental issues. As I said, there's so few opportunities to share. So it's, there's a lot of pent up energy and so it's just something to recognize. We don't often get these, these forums to talk. And so we want to be able to bear witness to other people's stories. And um, these are ecological topics, right? They, they can go in many directions. Like John Muir said long ago, you know, when you pick out one thing in the universe, you find a hitch to everything else. 
So climate grief can go in any direction on the compass, depending on the person and what they're thinking about. And that's just, that's just the nature of the, of the game here. Uh, so we can't talk about everything tonight and get to everything, but we do want to kind of create some space and really honor the emotions. You know, in our society, we often focus on the facts and what to do, the data and the policy, which is important, you know, but we don't often have, you know, the IPCC report doesn't have an emotions section in it to say how, how you should feel about the report and how to navigate it, right? That, that we don't do that in our society. So that's why this idea of eco grief and eco anxiety bubbles up all the time. Because there's, you know, there's not there's rare, rare moments of leadership around it. So we want to really honor the emotional piece tonight. And it's, um, it's important in and of itself. And just note that all environmental problems are really social justice problems, and um, equity problems and issues of power and privilege. So uh, we're all on some sort of front line, depending on our placement in, in, in the world, some people literally on a daily front line, other people because of their work or what they know. But this is this is an environmental justice issue that we're talking about, whether it's in Portland or in Oregon or in the, around the world, and it's diverse. There's going to be a lot of even in this group. There's a lot of different values, a lot of different uh, beliefs and, and knowledge and education, and a lot of different attitudes. So that's just the way it come, the way way it'll come to us. So this is really about multicultural competency doing these kind of groups, um, and you know it's an opportunity to learn from others. You know, I know we all have this urge to share and we should be able to share, but we, you know, it's also a place to open up and hear from other people that are different than us and expand our language. So one of the words I, I, I use is this idea of being a climate cosmopolitan as someone who knows about different, different ways people think about climate change and different, different belief systems and different kind of regions and different subcultures and kind of, can kind of navigate between these different groups. And I think that's a goal that's a goal to work toward. It can be really neat to, to, to learn different things about climate change and come out of our bubble. Um, and it can be inspiring. And it really helps us to work together with people because um, there's a lot of diversity in Oregon, as we know, you know, between the ocean and, and the mountains and the desert and the valleys, there's a lot of different people, a lot of different beliefs, different lifestyles, different cultures. And so we want to even be a climate cosmopolitan just even in our state and that, that itself is a challenge if anyone's tried to do statewide work. And you don't have to be an expert about this to be here. Um, no one is an expert, really. Uh, no one is an expert about climate change. They might know some deep knowledge about some aspect of climate change, but no one knows everything about climate change because it's too big of a topic. And they don't know all the cultures and all the experiences. So it's okay to be here. And when in doubt, just stay with the, the feelings because uh, validation has value, you know. So that's what I that's what I tell people, and you know this idea of climate environment and environmental grief, and um, and Daniela, well, I'll I'll try to be done in twenty minutes, but you know give me a high sign around five minutes too, so I can wrap up on time, so we don't run late. Um, but you know environmental grief, a working definition is is troubled feelings about either past, current, or future losses associated with climate change or other environmental issues. So it's it's, it's, it's a big topic because we could be feeling grief about things that have already been gone, things that we're losing, and things that we're, we're anticipating. And this could be personal, it could be global, it could be a tangible thing like your job, it can be symbolic, like a place or, you know, some sort of experience, it could be our lifestyle, our comforts, as well as other species and, and places. So it's, it's, it is, but it's, it's, it's troubled feelings about past, present and future losses That's one way to think about it anyway. And, you know, you're free to disagree with me as well. I don't, I'm not a fully an expert either. So these are just things that I find helpful. Um, it's important before we get into climate grief, just to think about navigating emotions in general about the environment, right? Because we have a lot of emotions. Grief is a normal, healthy emotion. Um, and so when I'm working with people, I like to actually get a feelings list out and have people think about what exactly do you feel about all these environmental issues and really get nuanced about it so we can really drill down you know sometimes people use just a few common words like scared or burned out or whatever but there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of words that we can get into and there's there's an empowerment in just really saying exactly what we feel about a certain thing um and uh back up a second um just the difference between feelings and, and emotions, just to be clear. Emotion is a physical thing in our body, is a physical state in our body. All sentient beings have emotional responses, whether it's a human or a turtle or a 
or a sea anemone or one celled organism. We, we either move toward things we like in the world or we move back and move away from them, things that threaten us. That's emotions. Uh, you can't be alive and not have emotions. But feelings are the language we have for emotions and feelings are more subjective and that you, it requires language and education. So we can't say that someone, no one has emotions, but some people don't have feelings because they don't really have a lot of words. So part of this whole grief work is expanding our vocabulary about different feelings, words. Um, and then, so it's getting clear about what we are feeling, which I'll talk about a little more in a moment. Uh, and then it's toggling between um, what you're feeling and also what you might want to be feeling, what feelings you want to grow. That's the radical thing of feelings work within the environment and any kinds of feelings work is growing feelings and moving toward feelings you want to claim. Uh, and sometimes there's um, stretch feelings like being optimistic or hopeful or something like that. That seems like a, a far stretch when I'm feeling disillusioned or in despair. Um, but there are middle ground feelings I can go to like being aware, being conscious, being present, being patient, having gratitude. So a big part of this is just kind of expanding our vocabulary and learning to toggle. Some of us tend toward the dark emotions or need to be in the dark emotions at a certain time. That's perfectly fine. Others of us tend toward the positive and creativity and trying to look on the upside of things. That's also fine. So you have your own style and then you have what you need in the moment. And then other, other people have their styles too. And some feelings are, are protected, like they're, they're scary to go to. And that's something we can kind of work on to, to share a range of feelings. Um, and then in terms of grief, environmental grief, climate grief, um, you know, one way, to, one way to think about this is to navigate this area in like a, a grief map. This is a thing that I've kind of come up with. But essentially, we can kind of navigate uh, between the past losses, the present losses, and the future losses. This is not fun stuff. This is hard work. But, you know, this does give us a little way to navigate you know, there are things that are gone, but not forgotten that I want to recognize. I want to, I want to respect, be in memorial of, live in the spirit of. Um, so as I'm talking about this, you can think about your own environmental grief and what, what's coming up for you personally. You know, what's a past loss that you have? Uh, what's present loss? These are things that are under threat now that we're losing. Either things that we, we know are going to be gone. Um, uh, or under under deep threat, extinctions and things like that. So that almost pulls for more of a hospice kind of end of life um, kind of attitude. And um, and there's a sense of dislocation and solastalgia, which is a kind of a neologism that was created to describe this kind of changing world where we're losing things while, while the world's leaving us while we're still here. And then there's future losses. There's anticipated losses, things that we're looking ahead that we're, we're worried about losing or, or already kind of feeling the future losses coming toward us. Um, there's a term in social psychology called the lost possible self. And it's, it's been coined to describe the situation where someone has to let go of a, a life plan that they thought they had. And we've all dealt, done with this, dealt, this, with, dealt with this before. Say you were in a job or a relationship and it didn't work out and you had to let it go and you had to kind of change your, your plans about the future. So it's, it's, it's a natural part of life to have these future selves that we create and then we, we don't always get a chance to live them. But there's a lost possible self about the world and about our place in the world that climate change is really, um, you know, creating for people. So it's, it's profound. It's profound. And um, so we're, we're all navigating this. There's, there's no... There's no right or wrong. Again, validation has value. It's just talking about it, sharing with it, recognizing it. Um, you know, grief and loss, some things that I've learned as a psychologist with grief, my own grief and working with people. Some losses are more complicated than others. If you know someone who lives a full life, a full good life, and they die in the in ripe old age, it's probably not that complicated. Uh, but if someone dies when they're young or dies in really a unfortunate circumstances, it can be a lot more complicated, you know, for that, for that, that loss to cope with that. And so climate and these losses are, are more, some of these more losses are more complicated than others. There's a sense of injustice. There's a sense of powerlessness. Um, there's all kinds of things that complicate. I mean, we know species that go extinct, all species, you know, are nature going extinct. And there've been many extinctions over the, over the, over the course of the history of this planet. But, but, you know, 
we when when when, when extinctions or losses are seen as unjust or preventable, you know, they get complicated. And you know, one of the help, most helpful things I've ever learned about grief is a statement that people grieve in character. People grieve like they do everything else in life. So if depending on your character, you bring your style to it. And I have my character and my style of grieving, and you have yours. And they're they can be different. And it could be challenging when someone close to us doesn't grieve in the way that we would like them to or we do. But that's that's the way it goes. People have, you know, I was joking, uh, kind of a really dark humor, but like around this, like people get to do their own apocalypse. They get to do it the way they want. So people come at, come at climate and some of the stuff in different ways. And when we're grieving and, and working through things, we, we oscillate between loss and, and recovery, between really being kind of disoriented and really broken down and then building ourselves up and moving forward. And we kind of oscillate and that's pretty, that's normal. And sometimes it, 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 you know, it goes really unexpectedly. And a big issue, a big issue is disenfranchised grief. It's, it's grief that doesn't have a place to live that isn't recognized. So that's kind of why we're, one of the reasons we're having this meeting is to, is to, is to, is to enfranchise this grief is to make it important. Like I say, you know, validate, elevate, create. So we want to elevate this, these feelings and get creative about them. Uh, and then to action, the action step that always is, is lurking here. Um, one simple way to think about it, grief is the feeling, mourning is the task, right? So what is mourning in this case? Well, it's public or personal acknowledgement of grief, it's activities to cope and move forward, it's living in a way that honors or does, does justice that what is lost, and it's, pr it's protecting what's threatened. So there are, there are a lot of different ways to do this. I spent a lot of time with people trying to think about their environmental actions, uh, what they should do. There's such pressure to take action, but it's okay to wait. It's okay to be first. You know, there's the old meditation saying, don't, don't just do, don't just do something, sit there. It's okay to sit there for a minute, you know, so we're not just frantically moving in action. Uh, but when we do think about action, we want to find our place, you know, toward the front line. And we have this image of always being on the front line, that front line of the protest or the engagement, you know, and, um, I've done exercises where I'll have people line up. I'll have everybody line up. And here's the front line. Here's the back line. Find your place. And everybody will mill around and kind of find their spot and then ask them why they place themselves there. Certain people are frontline people. They're always going to go to the front line. Certain people have other, other things they have to deal with in their life. So maybe they don't go to the front line, right? So there is the front line. There is a, there is a front line of action that we need to have people on. No change is going to happen without action. But I think for all of us, we have all kinds of places to stand in relation to the front line, right? So uh, when we do want to channel our grief and live in honor and protect, there's a lot of things to do. There are frontline people. You know, when I was younger, I was a frontline person and it wouldn't no matter what the situation was, I just would have been on the front line. But now I'm a parent and I do other things. So maybe I'm going to do other things to support the front line. But, you know, we need people doing all kinds of stuff. And every, so the point is everybody has a place. And, you know, maybe you're already doing important work for the world and you don't need to be doing explicit environmental work. Um, but the, I think the key is to work together. That's why I really like this idea of climate cosmopolitanism and knowing, knowing how different people work because there can be kind of a blind man and elephant problem with climate change where people say it's, it's this, we have to work on the economy or someone says it's technology or it's policy or it's spirituality, you know, it's all of those things. So we have to kind of, don't forget the elephant is what I say. And we want to work to get, work together on, on things. That's my thoughts to, I wanted to share tonight, just to get us going. There's a lot of course that I said, but, um, uh, picture me and my daughter in Forest Park. Uh, so I love uh, this place and I'm really thankful for you having me and I'm happy to take questions or just to be quiet. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was wonderful. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions if anyone has a question about all the rich information that was just shared with us. Um, yeah, Valerie. Uh, first of all, that was fantastic. I didn't know if this would be like the right place for me. And I'm so happy I'm here after that presentation. So thank you. Um, welcome. I particularly loved your slide at the end about roles on the front line. Um, and I took a quick screenshot for myself to reference, but is it okay if we shared that with other people or would you prefer we didn't do that? Uh, no, I'm fine to share that. Just, just tell people where you got it from. 
yeah, tell, tell, share my name. Yeah, that's fine. I think, well, I think we'll be sharing these slides and I'm, if, or I'm happy to share, share these as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is really great. Any other questions at this point? And there will be time for more questions later if any come up in a bit. Don't be shy, jump on in. Okay, I, I can't see everyone's faces. So, oh, Kat, great, I see a hand there. Um, yeah, could you um, just talk a little bit more br briefly about what you mean by cosmopolitanism? in terms of um, talking with people. And I'm, I'm just not quite sure what you mean by that. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is an idea that, I, that I've come across. Um, you know, I'm doing this podcast on climate feelings with my colleague from Finland. And so, I mean, the, my idea of well, the, well, the, what the word cosmopolitanism means to me is, is someone, that, someone that's kind of sophisticated and can move between different places. They can travel and, and speak to people. I mean, they might know different languages. They might know different cultures, and they they kind of can be in their own world, but they can also, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, and sort of be able to travel around like a traveler. I think that's kind of the or, you know the origin of that. And of course, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. But the idea of um, climate cosmopolitanism is what I again what I've found is that there's so many diverse ways that people think about climate change. There's a book, for example, that's been around in the past. It's called The Politics of the Earth. And it's all about the different, you know, different, the different ways people approach environmental politics. So some people are interested in technology. Some are interested in, in grassroots at organizing. Others are interested in business and innovation. Others are interested in government policy. Others are interested in kind of spirituality. Others are more interested in sort of like survival, survivalism and, and, and disaster response. And these are all like, these are all subcultures. And if you've ever done any climate work, you, you realize there's all these different subcultures of people. There are professional people that work, you know, work for the city and the state. There are, there are green business people, there are therapists, there are environmental, there are main, you know, big main, mainline environmental groups, as well as grassroots groups. There are activists of various kinds. And these are all, all different kind of countries in a way, different groups. And personally, I think the only way we're going to make progress on climate change is when we work together and form coalitions. So the idea of the cosmopolitanism is just kind of knowing your flavor and your style and being comfortable with that, but but also allowing other people to do their style and helping everyone to succeed, not not kind of getting into in in infighting, right? That's kind of a, hopefully an anecdote to infighting, and it's really hard to do. Uh, it's going to come up even in this in this group. I can tell you, people are very you know, attached to their ways. And uh, I mean, I can fall into it as well. So I try to, I try to have a bigger picture and realize I don't have all the answers and I want to, I want to kind of understand where other people are coming from. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah. Thanks. Great. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, and yeah, please use the raise hand thing with a little icon so I can see your question. Um, Myung, please. Uh, it's going to be the Jeff half of the, the Myung and Jeff couple here, but Thomas, thank you so much. I had, uh, I also had a question about that, um, climate cosmopolitanism, and I'm wondering, does that extend to climate change deniers, uh, you know, people who are just so, uh, in opposition to addressing and promoting climate justice. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it could, I guess it kind of depends on how you look at it. I, I, I think it does in the sense of, you know, this is such a, a, you know, it's a good question. We obviously don't have time to get into all of this, but yes, people have different attitudes about the earth, about humans role on the earth, about our obligations, about economy and business. And so I do think, um, I, I don't think we need to tolerate just crass denialism and, and things that are just irrational. I don't think we need to give any time to that. In fact, we shouldn't waste our time, any, any of our time dealing with, with folks like that who are just kind of paid to, to gum up the works. 
but you know, I think there are, there are some meaningful dialogues to be had with people that have different thoughts about, you know, humans' place on the planet or the economy and things like that. So I, I do think there is a subset of uh, of dialogues to have with people that might just be practically necessary to get things done. You know, so I don't. In, a, in in World War II in the Pacific, they had this thing called the island hopping strategy, where the, when the, and the the Allies were 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 fighting, they didn't fight on every single island. They kind of hopped different islands, and they let the other islands just kind of be isolated. And eventually, people gave up. So I think we got to do an island hopping strategy. We have to be practical. We can't fight every single battle, and we can't convince everybody. Certain people are not going to be convinced. They're just not. So, but I do think there are some strategic discussions to have in our lives that. And I think we kind of know that. We kind of know that. So that's that's kind of where I go with that. Great. Thanks very much. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. That was a wonderful grounding um, in these ideas. And thank you for your yeah depth of knowledge and scholarship and um, personal engagement with this. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so Emma. Um, who I am such a fan of Emma's work. Um, Emma and I had the pleasure of meeting at a residency out in um, Eastern Oregon um, and talked a lot about these issues around a, a fire <laughs> in, in the cold. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Emma, and you can talk a bit about how you understand these ideas. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um... And do let me know if I'm choppy. Um, uh, I, I live in Klamath Falls, Oregon, so I'm on a more rural internet here, and it's not always behaves as well as I would like. So let me know, and I'll go up to my son's bedroom, which usually is the sweet spot. Um, so I really wanted to, yeah, thank Thomas so much for that, for that setup. Uh, I honestly could spend my whole 20 minutes just uh, talking about uh, some of these great ideas that you brought up, but I will, I will stick to my plan, but there are a lot of intersections, as you'll see. Um, so I'm an environmental journalist, and I've been writing about biodiversity, ecology, conservation, and climate change for like 15 years. Um, and so that can really be tough to kind of live with this every day and to think about it every day. Um, in addition, I live in Eastern Oregon, and I'm in a fire prone area. And it's become a very regular feature of our summers now to have uh, fires uh, that affect people that we know, um, people calling each other, and then of course smoke for days and sometimes weeks at a stretch. So I do have a sort of a sense of living inside of climate change and it's not something that is in the future tense for me in any real way. It's definitely something that's, that, I, that we're all in now. Um, so I've had to have certain strategies for dealing with the sort of constant presence of climate change in my life. Um, and so I'm going to share that with you now. But but as, as Thomas said, uh, everybody gets to do this their own way, and everyone has their own uh, emotional style. So uh, this is very much just a sharing of my own personal uh, journey with this. Um, and I doesn't, it, you know, it might be very different from the way that would be most helpful for you. Um, but for me, what was really helpful and what really turned the corner for me was getting away, getting out of the shame and guilt part of the set of feelings that we often feel around climate change. Um, I felt guilty all day long for years about everything, about using a paper towel, about you know the fact that I travel for work, about everything I did that had an environmental impact. And it wasn't until I really kind of got my brain around how that individual level consumerist viewpoint about what our role is in the climate crisis has been strategically handed to us by uh, the powers that be, by the sort of status quo, by fossil fuel companies, um, that that was a very intentional framing, right? Like the carbon footprint was invented by British Petroleum. Um, and actually, I think the day that I found out that the carbon footprint was invented by British Petroleum was in some ways a turning point for me emotionally, because I realized that so many of us have been trapped in this cycle of feeling like we have to be perfect and pure and good in a system that makes it incredibly difficult to be perfect and pure and good. In fact, it makes it impossible for most of us to be perfect and pure and good. So that really moved me 
from, from a kind of an overriding guilt oriented feeling complex to one that had a lot more anger in it. Uh, now anger itself has its own pros and cons, but one thing that I kind of, uh, that I can work with with anger is it's, it's an action oriented feeling. It's a feeling that tends to push you towards some kind of action or reaction. Whereas guilt was something I was just marinating in, like a really unhappy olive. Um, the, the, the anger was something that I felt activated me. But if I, but you can't just live on pure anger alone either. Uh, it's, it's, a very, it's like a fuel that will, that will burn yourself up as well as uh, anything that you're trying to, to fight and battle. Um, so what helped me was really getting in touch with, with uh, why I was angry and what I felt was at stake here. And, and, and that was the things, the places, the species and the humanity in other humans that I love, right? What we're, the losses that we're facing that we're concerned with are important to us because we love those things. So our love is built into a lot of these negative feelings. And I found that my sort of love for the world and for humanity was there hidden underneath like when you pull back the leaves of a fern or something, it was there underneath these more negative anger type feelings. So then I found that if you kind of combine this anger, which I think still is an appropriate emotion to feel in a world that has known about climate change for decades, and yet the, you know, the, those in power have chosen, you know, very much chosen intentionally not to, to go down the path of addressing it. Um, but when you mix that with love, what do you get in my, in my body is the sense of determination. Um, and that has been an incredibly powerful place for me to be in. And what I've done with that determination is I have done some of this collective action that Thomas talked about. Um, and that kind of collective action is I have found in my life very therapeutic. Um, it is, uh, so I, because I live in Southern Oregon, I have worked with a group called Rogue Climate, which is based around the Rogue Valley, the Rogue River. Um, they're based out of Medford. Um, well, the Medford Metroplex talent in Phoenix. Um, in fact, their headquarters burnt down during the Alameda fire, uh, bringing climate change, making it very real. Um, so I got involved with them. Uh, one of the major campaigns we worked on was a campaign against a, a fossil fuel pipeline that they were intending to put through Southern Oregon. I worked on that campaign for years. I made friends. I had people come and stay at my house. Um, I cried with people. I got arrested once. Uh, it became a big part of my life. And then we won, which was actually kind of surprising. <laughs> I was always prepared to lose that fight. And I still thought the fight was worth it. And then sort of unexpectedly, we actually shut down. I mean, there were other factors, but even the fossil fuel industry press cited, you know, local opposition as, as a part of the reason that this project never came to be. So that was mind blowing to me. And, and it was also, you know, I'm somebody who is uh, motivated by sort of a sciencey viewpoint of the view of the world, as well as an emotional one. Um, and so what I did is some math. So this pipeline was supposed to, um, the, the sort of the calculation was is that this pipeline was going to emit something like 37 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. Um, and the average American emits something like 16 tons uh, every single year. So at one point during this fight, uh, we asked people who cared about this issue to submit comments to the state regulatory agency saying, I oppose this. And we got 42,000 people to do that send an email. Now I did a lot more than send an email. I was pretty involved, but, but let's just say all I did was send that one email. Okay, so now we're gonna take that 37 million tons of carbon and we're gonna divide it by the 42,000 people who wrote emails. Each one of them prevented 876 tons of carbon dioxide from going into the atmosphere, which it would take 54 years of zero carbon living to equal that much carbon. So for me, this math made me feel like, yes, this is where I'm gonna be putting my personal energy is with this collective work that we're doing together. Because I'm never gonna be able to perfect myself. I'm always gonna be feeling bad about my failures. But if I do this work, I can, I can be more effective in this math way. And then I can also create these relationships with all of these people who have these similar fears, anxieties, anger, all of these things. And, and those relationships become 
incredibly therapeutic and helpful in terms of me dealing with, with these emotions. Um, so that's, that's what's worked for me. And, and, and I was, I too took a screenshot of the, of the, where are we in the action, um, diagram because, I felt that was really useful. Um, I, I am a very frontline-y type of person, but I am also very aware that it takes people all the way back to the back. So um, when we would have uh, public hearings in Klamath County about this pipeline issue, I would be up there with the bullhorn yelling, and then my husband would be organizing the childcare so that all of the parents who wanted to testify could testify and their kids would have a place to go and he'd play tag with them. And some of the other partners were there making chili, so people had, uh, were, you know, didn't have to worry about making dinner for their family on the night of the hearing. And those people made it possible for us to break all these records in terms of how many people testified. It was really those caregivers that was that was able to pull that that event off. Um, so, you know, you don't have to be the bullhorn type at all to, to I think, to have this kind of collective action be be useful. And and again, and, and two, I don't think you have to jump headfirst into it. I think taking a lot of time to figure out what your what you want your role to be, how much time you're able to dedicate. You know what? And I would I would definitely suggest lowballing that. You know, if you think yes, I'm going to do this climate action and I'm going to do ten hours a week, like start it too, <laughs> because all these organizations would much rather, I think, have your consistent presence than, than to have you flame out after a short period of, of, uh, of action. Um, so that is what has been therapeutic for me. And I will just end by saying that um, I think that I wouldn't have been able to turn my anger into determination if I didn't have my eye on a possible good future. So I think a lot of us spend a lot of time thinking about possible negative futures, even probable negative futures that, that may come to pass because of climate change in terms of very specific things like we're gonna lose the coral reefs or just this kind of sense of the dark uncertain future where things are bad. Um, but I mean, I, in my scientific writing career, I spent a lot of time talking to climate scientists and I spent a lot of time talking to people who are experts in biodiversity conservation. And whenever I ask them, how much can we still save? You know, the sort of classic question, how, how screwed are we? Um, th there's, always ho there's always quite a bit left to save there, you know? So for example, you may have heard that we're in the sixth mass extinction. And that is based on the rate of extinctions that we are currently experiencing over the last 200 or 500 years, depending on the paper. Um, but for us to be, to really experience the entire six mass extinction, we would have to continue those rates of extinction for the next 400,000 years, something like that. Um, most extinctions happen over periods of thousands of years. And so I think that that is actually unrealistic to assume that we will still be as bad at conserving biodiversity 100 years from now as we are now. I think we will be better. I think we will get our act together. So we have documented something like 900 extinctions out of what we know are uh, probably a billion species. We still have time to save, not, uh, not the ones we don't know about, but we still have time to save the vast majority of them, right? They are not gone yet. They are salvageable. We can get them back. We can still avoid the six mass extinction. It isn't cooked in yet. It is not baked in. And I have to keep my eye on that future where we avoid the six mass extinction, where we are able to create a world for, our, for the humans that are still to come that is greener than the world that we're in today, that is healthier than the world we're in today, that is more just than the world we're in today. And I'm here to tell you that that world is plausible. So that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me determined is keeping that future in my mind's eye. So I'll stop there so we can uh, fit in some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. It's very inspiring and informative um, and funny, which is something that we need in, in the climate activism world. Um, Anyone have questions? And please use the um, the raise hand feature. Great, um, Kat, and then Beatrice. Um, yes, I was wondering if in your discussions with scientists, if you um, have ever brought up the issue of population um, and the population, how much population the planet can 
uh, sustainably support. Yeah, thank you for that. It's a, a question that I have looked into quite a bit, and um, it's a really it's a it's kind of a dark road to go down to talk about population and the environmental movement because there is actually a pretty unpleasant history of environmentalists uh, using sort of concerns over resource consumption to to sort of be, have an anti-immigrant agenda or to have uh, an agenda of saying, well, the people over there shouldn't be having any more babies. So it's an extremely fraught, um, a fraught and complicated conversation. There's actually a really good two-part podcast that the, the, the team at Outside In did uh, about population that I recommend listening to. Get, get, delves into this history in a bunch of detail. Um, I tend to, you know, it, it's obviously resource intensive living that is the issue here, much more so than just raw numbers of population. And it's, it is um, incredibly heavily weighted towards the highest users of, of energy and of resources. So um, it's also well known that this sort of demographic transition effect in terms of people having fewer children tends to follow when women have access to education and contraception. So my take on, on population is basically, well, we want women to have access to education and contraception anyway. So let's try to make that happen globally, just on the pure basis that women deserve access to uh, contraception and education. And then let's wor work on the resource consumption because that's really the issue. Um, and I don't think that um, there's very many people right now who are talking about population itself rather than resource consumptions, except some slightly scary eco-fascist types that I would um, uh, urge you to be careful of. Great, thank you, Emma. Um, Beatrice, or B, I'm not sure what name you prefer. B, B. Um, thank you, Emma. I, I'm the one who's got so emotional, I just stopped breathing. The tears came to my eyes because oh. you never hear people don't instill hope. And I know that everyone, you know, those of us who are worried about this are really worried about it. It feels very urgent, we're out of time. And we keep hearing this over and over and over. As a journalist, you're aware of media setting an agenda of the cultivation effect. Um, I think that if at some point people feel paralyzed, there's no point, it, you almost become nihilistic. There's no point in doing anything. We're all just screwed. Um, and so we're unable to take action. And of course, when you can't take action, you can't connect. And when you can't connect, people aren't making things better. You don't feel like it's better. Um, you, there's, what, is there an answer to this? I feel like, of course, so much of what goes on in the media is what is clickbait? What's gonna get you to do the click? What's gonna get you, what's gonna sell more of the media? And it is not making people feel hopeful. It is not making them feel like an action can be taken that will make things better. It's scaring the heck out of folks. It's, you know, violence, it's scandal, it's whatever is going to get your attention in the moment. Right. So I, I guess I'm asking you, what's the how answer? How do we fix that? that? <laughs> yeah, how do we fix that? <laughs> Let's just fix journalism while we're at fixing climate change, right? Um, I, I think it's a and real it's issue. The one that you bring up is a, is a very big issue. Um, and I think that, that it, you know, in fact, it's sometimes even traceable to the scientific papers themselves that the journalists are reporting on because scientists will, will, will understandably feel that their issue is extremely urgent. And so they will try to find a statistic that will be, that will grab the public's attention because they know how the media machine works, right? Um, so for example, there was an, a study on insect declines that came out um, that showed some pretty worrisome insect declines locally, but there were some extrapolations from the local data to sort of a to sort of global, uh, you know, global conclusions, and they extrapolated rates of decline that they were seeing in some species. And they said, well, if this happens to all insects everywhere on the earth, they'll all go, you know, the 40% the of them will be extinct by such and such a year. And when they were sort of questioned by this, questioned about this, they said, well, we wanted to make sure people thought it was urgent. We don't really think that's going to happen. Um, and so I think, I mean, yes, journalists are to blame, but sometimes knowing how the media machine works, there can even be a sense of, uh, uh, of, of sort of cherry picking the worst data um, among scientists themselves. So I think that th this question is uh, a tricky one that goes even beyond journalism. And it goes into our own psychology of what we click on, right? Like 
you can always blame journalists for creating clickbait, but who is doing the clicking? I am also when I'm off duty, I'm clicking on all those terrifying stories. So um, I think that, you know, there's a, there is a thing called solutions journalism that is, that is um, kind of people who kind of commit at some level to writing about solutions rather than problems. I, I, I would sort of count myself among that group. Um, and, you know, there are, are some outlets that are more scary than others. So, I mean, one thing that I would re definitely recommend everybody do is to take a considered look at their media diet, their media consumption, their scrolling habits. I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to myself here too, you know, I, I'm not perfect in this regard. But for example, the last two IPCC reports, I did not read coverage on those because I did not need to read the, that coverage because I know that the climate is changing and I know that things are bad. And when I need to read them for work, I'll read them, but I don't need to read them as a lay person because I already know the basic contours of the issue. And I don't need to, uh, it's not gonna make me more effective to, to kind of bathe in that information. So I always think to myself, if it's, is reading this gonna help me be more effective or is reading this just gonna make me feel worse and make me less effective? Great, thank you, Emma and Nora. Hi, <laughs> um, Emma, I was wondering, um, knowing that you live in Plymouth Falls and um, being involved in the long fight against Jordan Cove and um, you know, being involved in organizing in a pretty red area of, of Oregon, obviously, but that, as you said, is like living in climate change now with smoke, with fire, with, fossil fuel projects with um, all of those things, with water scarcity. Yeah. Um, and so I was thinking about what Thomas said um, about a subset of dialogues that are like strategically necessary conversations to simply get things done. Um, and then get, I was thinking about where, where you live and wondering if, um, if you've had any conversations like that where like, you know, someone who's like really on the opposite side of the political spectrum from you, but that you had some interesting uh, moments of connection or common ground, or I, I'm just actually wondering if anything just pops into your mind that you could share with us. Yeah, I mean, living here in a, in a predominantly Republican county has taught me a ton about how to talk to different groups. Um, for example, Rogue Climate is right now doing a, um, a, a kind of a project out here where they're offering discounted heat pumps so that people can get much more energy efficient heating and cooling in their houses. Um, they have a website they're putting together. I'm helping them just sort of tweak it to, for the local audience. The words climate change do not appear anywhere on this website. It's all just like be energy efficient, reduce your, in, your bills, have a source of air conditioning during smoky times. Uh, we, we just talk around it for, for sort of strategic reasons like that. Um, but I have to admit that after having lived here for eight years, I have uh, decided to move. I'm in the process of selling my house. And part of that is because of my own children. Um, if it was just me, I think, and my husband, I feel like I could stay here and sort of fight the good fight uh, in, in, in this area, but it's harder for me to kind of have my kids grow up here. There, there's a lot of sort of negative toxic uh, stuff floating around. The drought that you re referenced has brought up incredibly unpleasant tensions around town, especially between the agriculture community and the native tribes, the Klamath tribes here. So I'm gonna to continue to be involved in environmental issues here. I'm gonna to continue to write about this place, but I, at, after eight years, I've decided I can't live here anymore. I'm now part of the great sort, you know, the great sort of everybody's going to live with, with their political allies. And I have a lot of mixed feelings about that because I was proud of, being able to operate here and being able to to talk to people here, um, and I, I, yeah, it's this is this is the this issue is I don't have as easy of an answer for you. <laughs> I just wanted to before we go to the next one, there was a, a question in the chat by Max Wilson about finding organizations or specific environmental causes, and the very short answer to that is. I am currently writing an article for The Atlantic about how to find specific environmental groups to volunteer with. I am researching it right now. This morning I did two interviews on it. It should be out within the month. So I'm gonna hold off on answering that and I'm gonna tell you, refer you to theatlantic.com, look for my byline. It will be the definitive guide to figuring out how to find a, a group that speaks to you and that will be a, a nourishing home for you.
That's so awesome, Emma. I um, leave it to the journalist to like have that kind of perspective on what to do, how to find it. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Um, so thank you all for your great questions and engagement. And thank you, Thomas and Emma, for those um, really inspiring and deep presentations. I feel like one of one of the big reasons that I invited Emma and Thomas to be here tonight is that I really wanted to create an ecology of ideas. Um, I am an artist and a poet and a writer, and that's one way that I feel like I engage in um, this issue of climate grief. And it's the way that I'm best suited to engage with it, but it's not the way that everyone is best suited to engage with it. And I think one of the things that both Thomas and Emma spotlighted that I really appreciate is that we all have our best way to engage with this. And for each of us, it's going to be different. Um, a lot of us seem to, to resonate with um, the frontline slide that Thomas shared, which I also was really intrigued by and like tracking the ways that I've changed over time um, in terms of how I engage with these issues. I used to be the, the person, you know, um, getting the tear gas <laughs> at the presentation or, or at the demonstrations in my 20s. And I'm totally not that person anymore. Um, the way that I engage with it at this point is through um, making art and thinking and writing and teaching. Um, and I feel like those are really valid um, ways to work through these issues. And that's what I hope to share with you all tonight. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show some slides. So um, I'll just make that happen. Okay, so you all should see a slide. Is that working? Looking good? Okay, great. So this is, um, the circle is expanding. Um, that, that comes from a, a, a quote that was really, um, formative for me in thinking about climate grief. And it's by Vine Deloria Jr., um, who is an indigenous activist and writer. And um, I, think of, I think of him as a philosopher as well. I'm not sure if he would claim that title, but this um, quote appeared in my Oregon Humanities essay. And he wrote, when new, things ex when new things come into our circle, it expands. When new things come into Western society, another square is added. And because I'm a visual thinker primarily, when I read this quote, it was just like being hit by, you know, a, an enormous wave of, of some sort. And just, I was like, wow, that I can, I can see that now that makes sense. And I ended up thinking about something like this, um, where I was thinking about little squares versus a big circle. Um, and thinking about um, how the little squares correspond to this notion of progress and time, uh, linear temporal thinking, thinking in time versus thinking in space. Um, so thinking in time um, has this sense to it that we're going to, as a society and as an individual, kind of move forward towards this unspecified notion of progress. And this is a sort of foundational ideology of, of consumer culture um, and of, of our current culture that we live in. And it's, it's, it's foundational, so we don't really think about it or see it. It's not really um, obvious in how we go about our day to day. But I, I think that we primarily think in terms of time, like just think about how often we are disconnected from where we are and, and like what our bodies are doing versus how often we're thinking about how busy we are and how much we have to do in the amount of space that we have, the amount of time that we have. Um, so we're really caught up in this idea of um, being time-based and being um, driven towards a goal. Um, and there are some additional quotes there that I'll let you engage with in, in your own way, in your, in your own time, in your own space. But what I'm fascinated by is this idea of the expanding circle, this idea that, um, and this is common to indigenous cultures throughout um, the world, as far as I can tell, that indigenous cultures tend to be anchored in specific places um, that are 
that have a deep time memory. And when I say deep time, I mean like geologic history, like things that extend beyond a single person's memory or, or even a, a generational memory, things that go back um, to, to the origin of our species. Um, and this is this time, this type of deep time memory that can exist in the place um, is really where the, the deep emotions um, that, that, that both Thomas and Emma referenced come from. When we experience grief, when we experience sadness, when we experience a sense of loss, we're really, I think we're really engaging with something that goes beyond our sense of individuality. It goes into a, a sense of our, our, the deep time memory of our species. And this is really about place. This is really about space and place and how we are not individuals in any meaningful way, how we are part of an ecosystem and our bodies don't end at our skin and we continue out into the place that we exist in, whether we want to or not. So another really formative idea for me came from Gregory Bateson who talked about um, He's an anthropologist who is also one of the sort of um, primary thinkers in, in the initial stages of the field of eco-psychology. And he talked about the need to form an ecology of mind. And he specifically talked about the need to form an ecological aesthetics. And an ecological aesthetics, he talked about as a way to um, kind of dive into a greater sense of, um, of who we are in relationship with place and that we can attain this through engaging with literature, art, music, and those can feel maybe um, uh, a little intimidating sometimes, but they can also be engaged through play, wonder, and attention to nature. It doesn't need to be any sort of formal art practice in order to tune into this ecological aesthetics. Um, by ecological aesthetics, I think he was talking about a way of viewing ourselves as part of this beautiful creation that we exist within, part of this, um, this sort of thriving life of which we are one part. Specifically, I think of artists as culture makers and agents of change. And um, when I use the word artist, I'm using it in the lowercase sense, <laughs> um, both you know typographically, but also I think that so many of us are artists in different ways. Like my own art is um, grounded in in um, painting and literary practices, but I think of cooks as artists. I think of um, bakers as artists. I think of carpenters as artists. I think of teachers as artists. I think of so many of us engage in artistic practices. Whenever we're engaged in a deep practice of care and thinking about the ways that we create beauty in the world and the ways that we're in reciprocal relationship with the rest of life, I think we're engaging in art. And this is really what changes culture. So this goes back to some of the points that, um, some of the questions that Emma was talking through about um, you know, how journalism is so attuned to um, you know, showing us the worst information. <laughs> and that's not the fault of the journalist, it's the fault of a kind of consumer mindset where we have a, a, a bias towards negative information. Um, as humans, we are, and that's an evolutionary, evolutionary thing. We are going to pay more attention to, you know, the thing that might kill us or harm us than the thing that's going to help us, which we're, uh, okay, we're back in the recording mode. I don't know if you all heard that, but I heard it. Um, that in a culture in which all of our attention is kind of um, turned into a profit, wherever we direct our attention is going to be um, the, the, the thing that, that, that becomes um, the profit margin. So if our attention is directed towards the negative, that's what we're gonna be shown. Artists are able to present, I think, a unique um, combination of things that can be both challenging and nurturing at the same time. And I think it's one of the fields in which we're able to, to be really deep inside of an, an emotional universe while also intentionally relating with others without needing to be just, you know, just, just be clickbait or just be um, terrifying or just be hopeful or just be loving. It can be all of the above. And I think that 
in my own practice, being able to, to engage that kind of all of the aboveness of emotions, the kind of all at onceness that art can hold um, has been a really um, uh, validating and important thing for me. So I'm showing you just one example of like 10 billion <laughs> that I could choose of one artist I admire who I think shows this kind of like um, embodies this, this idea of artists as culture makers and culture changers. Um, this is Rebecca Belmore and this is um, from 1991. So it's, it's a, um, at this point, a kind of historical image, but this is a massive megaphone um, that she made and um, carried around, you know, not by hand obviously, but carried around with the help of others in a vehicle to various places in um, British Columbia and use this, um, use this megaphone to um, basically broadcast her, her ideas and anyone else's ideas who wanted to use it to the rest of, of, of the world. And one of the places that she brought it was to the prime minister's front yard. <laughs> um, and so she really was using this beautiful artistic creation um, to counter some of the forces that she wanted to um, counter in the world and doing so in a creative and kind of playful and um, uh, both a brilliant and childlike way at the same time. Um, because this is a fun thing to engage with. It's, a, it's an embodied thing to engage with. Um, and she was, that's one of the things that I think art and artists can do to participate in this process. Another thing that um, I think artists um, allow or bring into this, this narrative or this dialogue is to create rituals of public mourning. Um, and this, what we're all doing right now, what we're all engaged with currently, I think of as a ritual public mourning. Um, what Thomas said about grief being the feeling and mourning as the task, um, I think that we're, we're you know, a narrow conception of mourning might be like going to a grave and putting flowers on it or whatever your, your, um, your, your familial or cultural tradition is. But I think of mourning as any engagement with community in which there is a reciprocity and um, generosity of care. And I think that that's one of the things that we're doing right now. It can happen in any number of contexts. It can happen um, between just a conversation with friends. It can happen, you know, in in um, in a in a family dinner. It can happen in a gallery. It can happen. Been, um, through reading someone's work in a book it can happen in, in a, a, a thousands of different ways. But one of the things that I'm hoping that um, we can do both in this space and in our culture at large is sort of normalize the idea that we are all in mourning at this point, as we should be, as any feeling and thinking person um, informed person is at this moment. There's so much to be grieving and there's so much to mourn. And the work of grief is mourning and we can't possibly move through grief without mourning. And that is work that must be done in community. So I'm going to um, also touch on, on this quote, which has been kind of formative for me in terms of thinking about how artists engage with these issues. Um, and how we all can kind of um, reimagine ourselves in, in relationship. So Naomi Klein is an um, economist by training um, who's written a lot of, I think, really brilliant work about climate change. And um, one of the things that she challenged that I, I read her ideas on this many years ago, and it was very um, impactful for me, was this idea of human nature. Very often in, in conversations about climate change, um, they sort of dead end at this point where it's like, well, it's just human nature. We're just meant to kind of be terrible to each other and we don't care about each other and we're only out for ourselves and end of story. Like, what do you really say to that? And what she says to that is that actually we've been fed this version of human nature. We've been taught that um, that we are we are not we're not worth saving, that we're so isolated from each other that we've been convinced that we're in, not just incapable of saving ourselves, but that we're not really even worth saving. And 
I think that this is another kind of underlying belief that we hold in our in our culture without ever really examining it. And one of the things that I think art can do is bring these underlying beliefs forward and ask us to re-engage with them or ask us to really consider them consciously rather than kind of take them as truth. I think that human nature is something that is emergent. And what I mean by that is it's constantly changing. It's part of an ecological system. It's not something that um, exists and then is sort of fixed in time and space. It's something that we're constantly recreating together. And that artists as culture changers can help recreate this notion and under um, undermine this idea, um, this very, um, I think limited and detrimental idea of human nature as inherently self-destructive. Um, and Ursula Le Guin, who's a um, Portland author who, who you all might be familiar with, had this wonderful quote that I think speaks directly to this idea. Um, um, I, don't, I don't know that this quote really needs any explanation, but I always kind of come back to it as a um, illustration of how artists can change culture, can challenge these notions of, of human um, sort of humans kind of being stuck in, in, in one way of being. So what you're looking at here is um, the first image, um, the first painting that I made in, in my series of paintings that, that are called New Earth. So each of these is um, called New Earth, and they're just numerical in the series. And I'm going to move through the series um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty quickly just to give you a sense of, of what these paintings look like. And I'll talk about as I'm doing, talk about them as I'm doing so. Um, so um, and I'll be moving through um, in terms of the order in which they were made, just so you know. Um, so I started this series with the intention to try to find a way to like visually depict climate change. I have a background in science and I was like, if I can find a way to show these ideas, then, um, then it will help people care more about them. Um, and I... I was trying to kind of counter, uh, visually counter some of the sort of dominant ways that climate change is depicted, um, uh, that we often see these sort of violent images of like polar bears stranded on icebergs or, um, you know, things that are just really difficult to absorb. And so I was intentionally trying to create beautiful images. I wanted something that, um, that, that, put as like the, the primary mode and emotional engagement and engagement that um, that prioritized the embodied and the sensory, because I really do believe that um, that climate change necessitates a cultural shift more than anything else. And that cultural shift will shift our economics and our politics. But that cultural shift will begin by people um, like all of us um, engaging deeply and with what we're feeling and and what we're what our reactions are to um, these 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 massive changes that we are um, that we're experiencing in the now. As both Thomas and Emma made clear, climate change is something that's happening to us currently. It's not a future thing. It's not something that will happen to our children or our grandchildren. It's something we're all experiencing now, and I think that's becoming clearer. And as it becomes clear, I think that these, um, these uh, explorations of what it is we're actually feeling in our bodies, in our emotional lives is becoming more urgent and also more normalized. So I just wanna restate that, that whatever um, kind of complex range of emotions you're feeling, it's appropriate. Um, and part of what I think um, art can do is help make that um, help help take the stigma away from feeling whatever you're feeling. So just to explain what's going on in some of the in these images, each of the shapes that you're looking at here um, in all of the paintings are areas that used to be covered by glaciers um, that are no longer covered by glaciers. So these are shapes. I think of them think of them as the shape of loss. Um, so I use um, NASA satellite images um, to, to identify these shapes. So I'll um, look at a, a time-lapse image of, you know, an area 
from you know the 1980s versus an area currently and then i will create the shapes that you see here by tracing what has what is no longer there so i started this series thinking as i said that i was going to kind of explain something about climate change and what i ended up really um finding myself deep inside of within a few months of making this work was like an emotional experience of climate change that just floored me like i hadn't i had no i had no sense of how to proceed from it i was really um deep inside some of like the worst um the worst facts i had ever encountered and i was trying to translate these um these facts to images and i was do doing so but the 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 paintings started to get and i think this one's a good example actually they started to get kind of violent looking and they started to kind of override my intentions of beauty a little bit um and they also started to get really intricate and confusing where like you can't separate one shape from another shape and you can't say like this is the shape in this part of the world and this is the shape in another part of the world and i was just sort of along for the ride here as i started to think about what i was doing and try to analyze why they started looking this way i began to understand that what i was trying to depict was and um what thomas referred to earlier this idea that if you pluck any part of the web of life you're plucking all parts of it right and and that's sort sort of what started to show up here was that i was enmeshed um that we are all enmeshed that when you know an enormous ice shelf dissolves or, or or falls into the ocean in the arctic even though that's thousands of miles away from portland oregon in some way i feel it and in some way we all feel it and the the inability to extricate any part of these paintings from any other part of them um, is part of what i would think i was um, experiencing here through the act of making the art um, there's also a, a, a elemental part of these paintings that i was engaging with that that i learned a lot from which is that the paintings are made from rainwater um, primarily rainwater sometimes ocean water or river water depending on where i'm making them and a lot of that natural pigments. And so I was learning from the materials themselves, and they were teaching me a lot about the complexity of, um, of what I sometimes think of as, as like a contemporary version of nature, um, which is not pure and not simple and, um, and, 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 and really mimics in character, I think, the form of climate grief, which is a many, many emotions at once that show up and participate with each other in ways that are um, that are sort of unprecedented and difficult to track. It's a different type of grief in in my experience, um, and in, I think in many others' experience than than the grief that we experience in like um, losing a loved one. Um, when we lose a loved one, we are able to kind of move beyond it. Um, eventually, we're usually able to move beyond it. But what often happens with climate grief, and, and Thomas mentioned this, um, is that it becomes disenfranchised. It doesn't really have a place to live in the world. And when it becomes disenfranchised or unresolved or what is sometimes called ambiguous, it can be really difficult to move past the acute stages of grieving into something that can be more um, life giving and something that can be more activating in the ways that Emma described so beautifully. Um, one of the things that I think art can do um, that's uniquely attuned, that art is uniquely attuned to offer is that it can hold this ambiguity. It can under, it, it can, it can, it can hold the ambiguity of feeling both joy and wonder and gratitude, amazement at the um, enormity of beauty in the world, 
and it can also hold the grief and the the sadness and um and and the sense of of anger and the sense of rage and it can hold all of these things at once and i don't just mean visual art i will reiterate my idea of art as something that i think that we all do in various ways a garden can hold these ambiguities um a plate of food that you've made for someone you love or for yourself can hold these ambiguities. Um, a poem can hold these ambiguities, a short story can. Anything that we think of as art making can hold these ambiguities without forcing them to resolve into something that's like neat and packageable and um, something that we can kind of tie a bow on and say it's done. Um, because in, at least in my experience, and um, both Emma and Thomas touched on this, climate grief is not something that like comes and then you move through it and then you're kind of done with it. It's something that um, happens and you move through stages of it and you feel some days like you get it and you're on top of it and you're fine. And other days it feels like it might crush you. And then you move through another day and you're feeling a completely different set of emotions. And, and it doesn't really resolve in any meaningful way. But what it does do in my own experience is it can really enlarge our capacity for, for love. Um, and that's sort of where I've ended up currently with climate grief is that I think of it as sort of a tool for love. <laughs> and that might sound kind of, um, I don't know, maybe it sounds trite or hallmarky, but I, I mean love in a very large sense. And I mean art as an act of love. And I mean um, any kind of um, uh, cultural participation as an act of love, however you you feel most suited to engage with that um, that type of work. Um, so we're nearing the end of the series here, and I know that there's a lot that I've sort of sped across and moved through quickly. Um, let's see, I think. Yeah, so that's the last one. I'm working on one more right now currently, but that's the last one in the series at the moment. Um, so I am going to stop screen sharing and I would love to um, take any questions or comments that anyone has before we move on to um, offering some, some more ideas from Roselle and some a prompt. Yes, Kat, thank you. Um, I'm just curious about how you, or if you are, as you're making this art, um, how, are you thinking about how this is going to impact the viewer in, 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 in what respects and, and how do, how does somebody who, how do you, because these are quite abstract, if you hadn't explained to me, you know, what they were, I wouldn't know. Um, how do you communicate that to the, the people who are looking at that and, and trying to get this message, message uh, across and, and how do you hope it's going to impact? Yeah, thanks for that. And and there is a kind of conscious way that I'm trying to impact the viewer. Um, when they're displayed in a the gallery, there's always information about what people are looking at so that the um, the shapes can be contextualized and understood as you know how I describe them. But my primary, what I first want to do, honestly, is um, make work that's going to engage people's senses. <laughs> I want people to be kind of um, drawn to the work on a sensory level so that there's a, a desire and a willingness to engage with the ideas of climate change. Because I think for many of us, we're so sort of overwhelmed and scared a lot of the time in trying to think through, um, think through these issues that are really terrifying to think about deeply that I think art can be a conduit to emotional engagement. And I think it needs to start with an, an engagement with beauty, which is why they're so colorful. Um, you can't tell the, the sizes from these slides, but they're quite large as well. They're like human size. So you can kind of stand in front of them and feel them. Um, and engage with the colors in a way that can be quite pleasurable um, as an entree to thinking about the, the, really what you're looking at is a lot of loss and a lot of grief. And I want both of those things to live simultaneously in the viewer. Um, 
we any more questions we have time for maybe one more before we should move on and we'll have more time if you're able to make it on saturday to talk some more as well Yeah, go for it. Thank you. I'm sorry, I keep talking, but um, I just wanted to, um, I'm, as you were talking about uh, linear time, I, I just wanted to mention a little book. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's called Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lyman. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it just talks about yeah. different ways of thinking about time. So it's, it's, yeah, really, thank, it's thank really great. I read it years ago. I appreciate the callback. Thanks. I might revisit it now. Thank you. Um, all right, Razelle, are you, you want to jump in here and. Yes, thank you, Daniela, and Great. thanks everyone again. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Emma, so much for, um, for bringing your perspective and your wisdom and your curiosity and creativity and sharing it with us this evening. And thanks everyone for attending. 